Notebook 5, The Lorette Charnel House From the 2nd of June, 1915 to the 2nd of July, 1915 Part 2 Barthas and his comrades were at the terrible battlefield of Lorette, and a few days had passed since the accident, which had taken the life of their hated Commandant Nadeau, but which had also taken away their loved Captain Houdel. The Poilus continued occupying their new and devastated front-line trench at the Fond de Bouval, and that night would stand out as a particularly terrible one. Throughout the first half of that night, bombs and grenades fell around them incessantly. There was not much the French could do in answer to this. In their trench they had few grenades and even less experience throwing them. Alarms both true and false were constantly shouted, and these created nothing more than an enormous waste of bullets, as the Poilus fired blindly into the night, hitting nothing more than a lonely rat. In all likelihood there were only a few Germans hidden in no man's land, lobbing all those grenades at them. The stressful and dangerous night continued, and at one moment Barthas and a comrade noticed a silhouette with a bayoneted rifle running from shellhole to shellhole and heading straight towards them. They fired at it but missed. The figure then jumped into the trench, and to their surprise they recognized him as Del Sol, a soldier from their own company. It turned out he had gone out on patrol and had gotten lost, having to wait until nightfall to try and return to their trench. In their confusion they had almost killed him, but luckily their aim had not been good. At midnight a sudden cry went up to go to arms. It seemed the Germans were counter-attacking to retake the trench. Barthas could not see anything, but they all fired chaotically into the darkness. The soldier next to Barthas, Argens, had his wrist shot through right as he fired. Blood started to spurt in fountains, and Barthas was covered in it. The man thought he was a goner and screamed desperately, but Barthas yanked off his cravat and tied it around his arm as hard as possible. The hemorrhaging stopped, and Argens managed to get to a first aid station. Later on, he wrote a letter thanking that Barthas had saved his life. Eventually, the counterattack petered out and relative calm returned to their piece of trench. Lying on the ground at their feet, moaning and unrecognizable, were the two men who had been burned in the horrible flamethrower attack. As usual, no doctors or stretcher bearers had come to take care of them. Their skin was completely black, and one died that night. The other man was delirious and sang the songs of his childhood, conversed with his wife and his mother, and talked about his village. Hearing this, all the Palus had tears in their eyes. They're worse than murderers, cried an anonymous voice in the dark, to let these guys die without giving them a bit of care. Ah, if we weren't all cowards, said the well-known voice of Therese. Those who wanted this war would be here in our place. Then we'd see. It is too late now, chimed in Barthas. It is before things start that we need people to see clearly. Let us hope that those who get out of this will remember that, at least. And you, said Ferrier to Barthas, you who are writing about the life we are leading here, don't hide anything. You've got to tell it all. Yes, yes, everything, everything. We'll be there as your witnesses. Maybe we won't all die here, added the others. They won't believe us, said Mondieu, or maybe they won't even give a damn. This conversation touched Barthas deeply, and it would stay with him for the rest of his life. But, consumed by fatigue, all he could do now was sit down and sleep in the only spot available, between the two burned men. He leaned on the man who was dead, while the man who was nearly dead leaned on him. In the horrible reality he found himself in, Barthas's heart could not be bothered by this. 
and so he slept. He was awakened later by the arrival of a soldier from another company, who had been told his brother had been killed and was desperately looking for him. The man leaned over the burned soldier and could not tell if he was his brother. Joseph, Joseph, he screamed desperately. Answer me, it's Pierre, your brother, calling to you. But it was useless. He was talking to a man who had lost his mind. By this point, the company no longer had any officers. The only one left, sub-lieutenant Kohl, had almost been buried alive when a shell collapsed the trench he was in. He managed to dig himself out and emerged very badly bruised, but had the bad luck of not having a single cut on his body. As Bartha said, wounds that made you bleed but a little were considered glorious, evidence of one's service to the motherland, but bruises and crushed ribs could not be easily seen and received no pity. The sub-lieutenant was very hurt indeed, but he emerged without the slightest scratch on his body, so he only received suspicion from the colonel and was forced to stay in that terrible trench. The following day they took his command away and transferred him to another battalion. Without the sub-lieutenant, the 21st Company's fate was now in the hands of Adjutant Kamnat, he had been a non-com all his life and was a hard-bitten maniac who had just turned his lieutenant's stripes that very night. He would stand at the entrance to the communication trench with his revolver in hand and stop anyone who had the slightest inclination of escaping the trench. Bartha said that he did such a good job and kept them so busy that the Germans lost any desire to try and take the trench by surprise. Kamnad also made sure all the wounded were evacuated. When he received the news that the chief medical officer was complaining that they should stop because they were only bringing him dead bodies, Kamnad said that he would bring him even more dead bodies, just to make him madder. When they came, there was only the burned and delirious man left. The coffee ration arrived and all the paloos were prepared to enjoy it, when suddenly the burned man said, and what about me? Aren't you going to give me any? They were dumbfounded. They had expected him to drop dead at any moment, and here he was claiming his share of coffee. He drank three full mugs and a little wine, and this seemed to liven him up a bit. Barthas ran towards Ajatan Kaminar, who almost shot him thinking he was deserting, and told him about the incredible resurrection. The adjutant assigned four men to carry the poor man to the first aid station, and Barthas heard no more news about him. On June 7th, they were enjoying a comparatively calm day when they received good news. They were going to be relieved the next night. Then they received the bad news. They were going to attack before that at three in the afternoon. By this point, they looked more like ghosts than living men. Days without sleep, together with all the hard work, bad food, terrible thirst, and the horrible fears and anxieties of the battlefield had brought them to their limit, and now they were being asked to attack. Bartha said that at least the cooks and ration squads did their best to give them decent food but it was still extremely difficult to eat when the air was filled with the smell from hundreds of rotting corpses and thousands upon thousands of the disgusting flies of Lorette swarmed around them. The soldiers, above all, asked for something to drink so they could slake their terrible thirst, and, to their surprise, with much effort and exposed to much danger, the ration teams brought each section a keg of beer. Being a barrel maker, Barthas was asked to tap his section's keg, and finally they were able to really quench their thirst. As for the planned attack, fortunately it did not take place in the end. With their calculations, their superiors realized that their numbers were completely insufficient for the attack to have any chance of success, and so they cancelled it. Finally, to the Palou's great joy, 
the relief was announced for nine in the evening. At the appointed hour they were all ready, but no one came. Hours passed and still no one came. Kamnad was furious and sent runner after runner. Then, when dawn was breaking, the battalion that was going to relieve them appeared. In the night they had gotten lost in the maze of trenches, but had finally managed to find them. With this, they left and went about a kilometer to the rear to a place called the Wolf's Ditch. It was nothing more than a wide piece of road that had not been bombarded yet. Despite it being a garden of delights compared to the Fond de Bouval trench, it was immediately apparent there was no shelter to speak of. When the soldiers complained that they had no place to sleep in, Caminat mocked them, saying that here the nights were not made for sweet dreams. Their orders were for work details every night. It was easy for Caminat to mock them. At the end of the road he had a nice dugout where he could sleep as much as he wanted. Each night they had to go out and repair the day's damage to the trenches, so that ration squads, stretcher bearers and relief units could move towards the front line. It was exhausting work and they were promised that after this they would go to the rear for real rest. But, as so many times before, this was a lie. On the nightfall of June 11th, they returned to the sinister Fond de Bouval trenches. They were now a few hundred meters to the left of their previous positions, but it was still the same hell as before, and they had to work repairing the trench and manning the listening posts. The main difference was that now their squad was completely alone in their section of trench. Their superiors had been scared by the number of casualties the French forces were suffering, so they now left only a few scattered squads in the front zones to provide some surveillance, and abandoned them to whatever fate befell them if there was a German attack. On the dawn of the 13th of June, the men of Barthes' squad were resting in a rather deep stretch of a communication trench after a night of hard work. They were reading, writing and sewing. Some were even sleeping. Then a couple of shells exploded nearby. Here come the wake-up snacks again, someone said. No one paid them much attention. A moment later there were new explosions, this time closer. Some of them immediately got up, like animals sniffing danger. These were no simple shells either. They seemed to be 150s. A single one of these shells could wipe out the entire squad if it was well placed. A few minutes passed, and then they heard the dull thuds of the German cannons firing. A few seconds later, the shells landed with huge explosions about 80 meters away. Perhaps it was possible that a German spotter had seen them and was guiding the artillery towards them. Opinions were divided. Some wanted to go, others thought they were safe in the deep trench. Barthas wrote that throughout the course of the war he had on many occasions a strange intuition, an instinct about the imminence of danger, and at this moment a voice deep inside him screamed that it was time to run. Everybody, pick up your gear and get ready to move out. Stand up, get a move on he cried out to all the stunned soldiers. Never before had he given his orders with such strength. Seeing that the men were ready, he waited for the next shot. It soon came, like thunder. The enormous shells crashed thirty meters away from their position. Dirt and rocks fell on them. Clouds of black smoke darkened the sky. There was no more doubt. They were after them. Head to the right, shouted Barthas. Save yourselves, hurry up, let's go, move out. Barthas waited for all of his men to get out. He considered that, like the captain of a sinking ship, he had to be the last one to get out. For him, when one accepted a promotion, even one as small as that of corporal, one had accepted the attached responsibility of one's new position and had to step up to it. His friends, Gilles and Allard, 
screamed as they fled. Mondier doesn't want to come. Go get him. Barthas ran towards him. Tort was next to Mondier, trying to convince him to leave. When he saw that Barthas came, Tort took off. Mondier, the school teacher, was hunched over, quietly writing a letter just as calmly as if he had been at his desk in front of his class. He did not seem to care about the incredible danger. Barthas asked him if he was crazy. Did he want to get himself blown to pieces? What the hell, replied Mondier. Maybe you'll get killed where you're going. No, begged Barthas. They've been moving steadily in this direction every time they fired. The next one is right in line with the one before. It'll land right here. Come on. Mondier simply shook his head and continued to write. Crouched across from him was a soldier from the 14th squad. He was Lafont, a tailor. He was sewing his overcoat. Barthas did not know why this man had stayed with their 13th squad, but asked him if he did not want to follow them. No, said Lafont. If Mondier stays, I stay. Before such stubbornness, all Barthas could do was save his own skin, and he ran away. He had barely covered 60 meters when he heard that terrible detonation behind him, right where they had been a few moments ago. He barely had time to hit the ground and avoid the blast. Then he got up and ran towards the spot where his squad had taken cover. A few more salvos landed. Then the German cannons turned their mouths away to some other place. At that moment, the daily cannonade of Lorette began. Smoke darkened the sky and the noise was incredible. But after a while, one simply ignored it. Some of the men even managed to sleep through it. But they were all very worried for Mondier and Lafont. Barthas reproached himself for not having the strength to make them come though he knew it was not his fault. Perhaps they were not dead but wounded and needed help. Barthas asked for a volunteer to help him search for them. Airi immediately stepped forward. He was illiterate, and Mondier had helped him by writing his letters to his family. They approached the place where the communication trench had been. Twenty paces from it, they found a shredded musette bag with only a notebook intact inside. It belonged to Mondier, and it was the only memento Barthas could find and send to his family. The trench had been filled up by the shell. They excavated a bit and uncovered a boiled, shriveled head. By the distinctive shape of its cap, they saw it was the head of Mondier. All his life, all his intelligence had been ripped off from the world. Their limbs trembling with sadness, they covered his head with a few shovelfuls of dirt. They learned later that for some time Mondier had had a premonition of his fate. The very day before, he had written a very sad letter to his family, practically saying farewell. When the body of Lafont was uncovered that evening, it was intact, without the slightest wound. He had been killed by the concussion of the blast. The 13th squad worked finding the body of Mondier and giving it a proper burial. They barely got this over with when they were called to man a forward listening post. An engineer team arrived to repair the trench and the Palouse asked them to watch out for their comrade's grave. The engineers did not care at all and dug right next to it. When the Poilus returned the next morning, they saw that all the dirt they had dug from the trench had been piled up on top of Mondier's body. They did everything they could to save it from oblivion. They stuck on top of it a simple cross made with two pieces of wood and next to it planted a bottle neck down with a piece of paper with his name written on it. But they knew that soon a few shells landing nearby would make an end of the grave, and the name Mondier would live on only in their memories. That forward listening post to which they were sent to spend the night also had an unfortunate accident. 
A shell had fallen right in the middle of the half section there, and a man from the 14th squad took a piece of shrapnel right into the heart. He died without saying a word. They had hardly known him. He had arrived with the latest reinforcements, and that was his first and last frontline duty. On June 14th, the Germans focused their artillery fire on the area they were located. Throughout the day, Barthas and his comrades had to run and scatter from one place to another, escaping the shell fire. At one moment, Barthas and two comrades went to look for cover in a listening post, and they unexpectedly met Corporal Marty of the 14th Squad. The man was on his knees with a rosary in his hands. Highly devout, the corporal had come alone to await his death in prayer. He had had a premonition of his end, and Bartha said that indeed, a few days later, he would leave the world of the living. At nightfall, the squad managed to regroup, and Barthas received the unfortunate news that his comrade Ferrier had been wounded in the leg by a shell. Ferrier managed to bandage his wound and then had to make his way to the aid station. Barthas wrote that with him the squad lost a steady, thoughtful soldier on whom one could count in any situation. Robust and courageous, he had been a hard worker and I am sorry that I could not shake his hand before he left. Finally, at ten o'clock, they were relieved by a battalion of light infantrymen and were sent to the town of barlin le which they reached after six hours of marching. They were billeted in the red brick houses of the miners, who received them well. They had not come to Barlin to rest, but simply to replace their losses with numerous reinforcements that had been waiting for them there. The drop in quality was noteworthy. The reinforcements were now made of free threads and peacetime auxiliaries. Barthas's 21st company alone had lost nearly half its members and needed 100 men. The total losses in the regiment were not treated as a big deal or something abnormal despite the fact that almost all of the other companies had suffered just as much as the 21st, and in some cases even worse. They only stayed 24 hours in Barlin, enough to equip and incorporate the recruits, and on the night of the 15th to the 16th of June were sent back on the way to the front lines. But at dawn they were stopped at Sanz and Gohel. It seemed no one had expected them, and no one knew what to do with them. They were formed up in clusters along a few streets for several hours, with strict orders forbidding them from wandering off. One of the soldiers in a neighboring company, Paul Conn, complained out loud that they were being led by idiots. A snitch of a sergeant carried these words to the company's captain, and Paul was court-martialed and sentenced to two years of prison and separation from the regiment. Finally, the men were ordered to billet in the houses of the town, but to be on high alert and prepared to leave at any moment. Their superiors were blind to their fatigue and were certain the German lines would collapse at any moment. Sanz and Gohel had grown around its big mine, and usually the town did not suffer any shelling at all, though, during their stay, a single German big shell fell there for reasons unknown. On June 24th, the regiment received orders to move up to the trenches. The 13th squad had replaced their lost Lados, Ferrier and Mondier with three new names, François Ventresque, Favier and Pellissier. The squad was sent to a communication trench, which was fine despite the fact one could not sleep there without being stepped over by Palouse passing by in large numbers on their way to the trenches. They were used for all sorts of exhausting work details throughout the night. On June 25th, there was a violent storm, and the following night was completely devoted to bailing out water with shrimping nets. That same day, they were relieved from these exhausting duties 
and were sent to the front line. It was 800 meters away, a distance that normally they could have covered in 13 minutes, but which now took them five hours, because, whether deliberately or by coincidence, the Germans bombarded heavily the communication trenches they were using, causing many delays and much chaos. Their half-section got lost and mixed up with other units, but eventually they managed to reach their company at the front line. They were considerate enough to place them in the rear and let them rest that night. The three rookies were completely exhausted. The artillery barrages they had to cross, the blinding bursts of flares, the explosions of shells and grenades, and the constant drumming of bullets had strained their nerves to the limit and they were terrified. The veterans of the squad amused themselves by frightening them even more, making them crouch and hit the ground while repeating that this was nothing, that they should wait for when things got really serious. The night passed, and when day broke, they discovered with horror that the bombardment had overturned and revealed the place around them. They were surrounded by broken rifles, shredded packs, and even some dead bodies. During that day, they had another close brush with death. They were resting at three in the afternoon, when suddenly a huge shell brushed right past the heads of Gilles and Allard and fell right in the middle of the squad. There was a huge shower of earth, and they all held their breaths, waiting for the explosion that would obliterate them. But the shell was a dud and did not blow up. Sometimes it happened. Half of the squad had fled in terror, but they soon returned. It was no safer anywhere else. In the trench they found the corpse of some poor soldier. He was so mutilated that it was impossible to recognize him. Nearby was a knapsack which surely had belonged to the corpse. They checked it to see if they could find the identity of its owner. There, they found a good pair of corduroy trousers, which Barthas took to replace his own worn trousers. It was not time to waste materials. They also found a pile of letters and postcards in the name of Labou Carrier. They were surprised and saddened. Everyone knew Labou Carrier. He was famous for all kinds of eccentricities, his colorful clothing, and all the funny songs and jokes he made in the cabarets. Fulfilling their duty, they sent these letters and the military papers to the sergeant major of the 23rd company, to which the dead man had belonged. The sergeant major was quite surprised, for it turned out that La Boucarie was very alive and as healthy as the trenches allowed. At this, the man had to explain how he had lost his pack and had to admit that he had run away from his post after a violent bombardment. So he was sent to a court-martial. Bartha said that from that point on, La Boucarie had it in for him for two reasons, firstly, for having brought him all these troubles, and secondly, for having taken his corduroy trousers. That night, the squad was sent to help rebuild a big stretch of trench which had disappeared under the bombardments. The place had been the scene of battles, attacks and counterattacks, and the ground was strewn with corpses. When they heard what their assignment would be, the rookies went pale with fear. Barthas decided to leave them behind in the shelter. Her absence would easily pass unnoticed. At 9 p.m., the men assigned to this task, about 14 total, left following Sub-Lieutenant Malvesi who would deploy them along the line they were to work in. The night was very dark, maps and compasses were useless, and they had to be guided by instinct. But this time, instinct failed them. Those who were up front with the lieutenant ran right into a German trench. The first signal they got of this was when they started to hear the shouts of German sentries, probably even more scared than them, asking who was going there. Then it was chaos. Everyone ran as fast as they could with no idea of where the French lines were located. 
Shots filled the air and grenades exploded. The men jumped into shell holes for cover, but these got crowded fast. Men were flattened on the ground and the squad was scattered. Barthes and others started to ask in whispers to the ones around them. Hey, you, over there, what company? And you, what about you? Are you in the 21st? But these questions went unanswered. They were all addressed to dead men. It was a slaughter. Bartha said he spoke for his fellow survivors of the 13th squad, his friends Thord, Allard, and Gilles, when he said that nowhere else throughout the war, not even at Verdun, did they see such a deadly harvest of souls than in those few minutes. To Barthes, it was monstrous that so much strong youth, full of life, was sacrificed to take and retake a few square meters of shell holes. The survivors stayed perfectly still in their holes in anxious expectation. They were certain that with this alarm, a bombardment would sweep the fields at any moment and obliterate them. But fortunately, no bombardment came. Soon, things calmed down, and they managed to rally and start doing the work they had been assigned. The next morning, the squad reunited and saw that the only one who was missing was Tord. They feared the worst for him, but later in the day he reappeared safe and sound and told them his story. When chaos had broken the previous night, he had jumped into a shell hole where other soldiers had taken cover, but soon saw that they were all dead. Terrified, he ran and fell into a trench full of Moroccan sharpshooters who had almost killed him on the spot. He had finally managed to reunite with the squad in the morning. That day was marked by violent and constant bombardments on their lines, but the men barely noticed it. The 21st Company had some men killed and wounded. Among the killed was a man called Bigou, who Barthas had known. Barthas says that they were all happy when they were moved up to the front lines that evening. They were happy to leave that horrible communication trench and to not have to go and continue working on that place where they had been so terribly massacred the night before. In the latest offensive, the French had reached the village of Angre, but a counterattack had pushed them back to the point where Barthas's 13th squad was located now. In the plain beyond Angre, they could see the German-occupied villages of Lievin and Len. Barthas noted they were just a few hundred meters away from Angre. In their sector, there were no listening posts. Sentries were posted three or four paces from one another by half section. One squad guarded while another slept. That night, and the next one of July 1st, passed without incident, but Barthas finished the notebook with an ominous note, saying that soon, during the night from the 1st to the 2nd of July, their trench was going to be bloody, and in their half section, Fifteen men were going to be killed or wounded, in circumstances that he would describe shortly. And here ends the fifth notebook. As we have seen in less than a month, the Palus have suffered terribly. The 21st Company has been terribly bloody, and Barthas and all the other Palus have lost comrades, friends, and even brothers. Their world of horror and suffering is a minuscule portion of the enormous tragedy that is the great war in which they find themselves, and which still has much more to go before it finally ends, taking many more lives with it. Sometimes it is very difficult to look at all these meaningless slaughters over and over again, but it is essential to never forget. As Barthas's friends told him when they were in the middle of one of the most hopeless situations a person could ever find themselves in, do not hide anything. You've got to tell it all. Through this, through remembering the stories and lessons that the past holds for us, we can try and avoid making the same mistakes of the ones that lived before, to improve things, even if only a little. Meanwhile, 
I will continue narrating Barthes' story in the sixth notebook. I'll see you until then, and I hope you have a good day.